Every morning at half past four, you hear the cooks hop on the floor. It's hard times in the mill, my love, hard times in the mill. Ain't it enough to break your heart? Have to work all day and at night it's dark. It's hard times in the mill, my love, hard times in the mill. It's hard times in the mill, my love, hard times in the mill. Concrete Feathers Porcelain Tax is a title and came for me really early on um, in making the work. It reflects on, I suppose, this idea of the industrial, the industrial landscape, the brutality of that, the hardness of it. But it's also about the warmth, the gentleness, the human kind of contact, the way that we um, survive or endure things. Um, and so it's, it's a kind of contrasting of materials and this idea of hardness, hardship, softness, warmth, um, the kind of textures of, of collective living. Rochdale is the uh, birthplace of the cooperative movement in the Western world. The cooperative movement developed as a response to some of the really difficult hardships that people who worked in the mills were experiencing. Um, around access to food, access to warmth, heating, shelter in many cases. Um, and so the principles, these seven principles, which are kind of loosely couched around the ideas of collectivity, um, around the idea of responsibility, what stake we have, how much we give in terms of how much we get back. And so I wanted to take these principles and have conversations, loose conversations about what that means now in a kind of contemporary setting. My mum and dad left me there for a week and then they come for me the week after and bought. See, we all lived in tourist houses and the mills and the hundreds of mill chimneys you could see. You could see hundreds from the end of the street. And, um, but she lived in a council house which had a garden and they were fascinated. We have a retired uh, joiner, Pete, who has been rewilding um, a patch of ground, a piece of land um, on the outside of a, an estate that he lives on um, in Rochdale. He talks about his early childhood, his kind of beginnings of interest in, ter in terms of nature um, as a kind of lead in. And then we, we see him at the rewilding site. We have a group of young people who wanted to be part of the film and I introduced them as bringing their kind of an idea of the future, an idea of the legacy of what they've taken on living in Rochdale and how that might transform. And so they come in and out and in and out of the film as a, a kind of active group um, and they have conversations about the things that they like to do but also the things that are difficult in terms of social media. We have a group of older people who are from a dance and movement group and they choreographed a, a small piece with their dance teacher um, sitting on a bench in the park, um, which is about Rochdale, it's about what they like to do. It references the Seven Sisters Flats. Um, we meet Sultan, who's the ex-mayor of Rochdale, um, the first Asian Muslim mayor of Rochdale. And he takes us, I guess, on a story, a little bit of his life. He, he talks about being a small child as a goat herder, moving to the UK, being unwell as a child and having to spend time in hospital, and then his kind of commitment to Rochdale, um, and then his subsequent position as a mayor. I mean, I guess the whole film is about the intersections of human existence, really. Um, the moments where people meet, whether that's, again, across time or across kind of geographical locations. And so they kind of unravel as the film progresses. Um, and we meet different people who share their, their stories and their lives with us. My whole childhood memory at home is based around sewing. My mum taught actually a lot of women who had come over from Bangladesh how to sew, um, and she taught my sisters. So we're a family of machinists. And every day, you know, after school, my siblings, my older siblings would come and help my mum and dad stitch. Um, as well, so it was almost like a little factory inside the house. 
We've used paintings, objects, artefacts um, from the museum collection. So I selected a large number of objects and paintings and we started to have online conversations using those objects and paintings to stimulate further discussions that we were having in the groups. So what I realised was maybe four of the people who talked about their families had had parents who'd worked in the mills um, or parents who'd sewn. And so a sewing machine became one of the selected items, for example. So it's about using the, the objects. And we were really lucky that actually the collection were really supportive of us actually using the artefacts rather than the idea of the display cabinet. We were allowed to use them as kind of almost living objects. So we have one scene as well um, where the Coal Not Doll mug, which is from the miners' strike in the late 70s and 80s, is actually being used to drink tea. So it's this idea that these objects are still living, the idea of history still being alive. So sometimes the person who's in it is having an interaction with the object or the painting, or they're using the artifact. Sultan was completely excited by a painting called the Trick Track Players, um, and he said it reminded him of being in Pakistan. So we have that being installed in the Touchstones Cafe on, on a wall that had nothing on it. And so um, we've kind of created a scene where he's, he's in charge of the installation of this painting. So it's this kind of intrinsic idea, the relationship with the object and the collection, and the idea that the collection actually belongs to the community. Often museums feel out of reach and we only get to see what we see when they're put in a display box for us and it's decided for us. And so this was about using, I suppose, the Rochdale principles about ownership and shared ownership um, to use objects and paintings uh, in a much more collective sense. Rain slides down and snow slips underfoot. The tram meanders from Oxford Road to Watchdale. It is a place unknown. The unknown is never this. There is always something familiar. The glinting of sun in the eye. The point that nail meets skin. The surface of dust, a child's cry. So I have a number of ways, I suppose, a number of strategies for storytelling. Um, sometimes it's about uh, my voice being the central voice and I use different voices, usually from text or song or poetry, alongside my voice to try and tell different kinds of stories, as well as bringing in some of the dynamics of making as well. The start of the film, we can hear the cameras start to roll, set. Um, there's a point in the film where we see the sound man uh, making a click. It's about un unpicking and unravelling the whole process of, of filmmaking, and that includes me, but also the people who are also working with me. There are conversations about the future. There are conversations about the past. There are conversations about upbringings, hardship, um, really kind of matter-of-fact conversations about how we are with each other, uh, about the impact of kind of political decisions on towns and cities. Um, and all of these things are about human experience and human existence. So I think for me, that's one of the things that I would really like to be taken away from the film, um, is for people to be touched by the human humanness of what's being spoken about. Oh, my God.